Hi, uh, it is, this is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday, so um, this is Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions. Um, feel free to write to me uh, on my website, uh, janetfitchwrites.com, uh, or uh, put your questions in the comments. Um, uh, always happy to answer uh, writer questions uh, as they come up. So um, we have questions for uh, this week. Um, certain things we actually touched on last week. I had my... Uh... Heidi, I'm doing your question today. Oh, wonderful. Good to see you. So um, uh, welcome to Writing Wednesday. Yeah, last week uh, uh, I... Uh, uh, appeared with my uh, comedy writer husband uh, and he had some ideas about how to you know, stabilize your um, view of what you wanted from your book. Uh, so if you missed that, you might want to check that out. Uh, um, it's uh, kind of thinking about the book as it will appear on your shelf when it's done. Uh, and the feeling, trying to pin down the feeling of what you want your reader to have experienced once they close the book, uh, which I think was such an interesting way of, of thinking about uh, fiction. Um, so, hi, Malika. So, today our question uh, from Heidi uh, from two weeks ago was about melodrama. What is melodrama as opposed to drama? Um, it's a certain kind of drama. Um, it kind of has relationship to fiction as, as farce has to comedy. It's a certain heightened emotion, um, but it is problematic, and I'm sure that many of you have uh, brought things to your uh, writer's group or maybe to a workshop and have been told that your, you know, incredibly tense dramatic scene was melodramatic. Now, everybody has their taste for drama. Um, one person's melodrama is another person's drama. Some people feel that, uh, say, Tennessee Williams. Hi, MJ. Hi, Liz. Um, some people, f I was just reading uh, Anais Nin's um, diaries from, I think it was 55 to 65, something like that. Yeah, and she felt that Tennessee Williams had plunged into the melodramatic. Um, I personally just find them highly flavorful and very dramatic and uh, uh, unafraid of conflict and in a way that Nin felt was... Um, uh, over it was heavy handed. So some of this is about taste, but I think we should think about what melodrama is. If you like something that's highly dramatic, like I do, I have to be more careful than somebody who is really, um, subtle and terribly averse to, to, um, areas of high drama in their work. Uh, they will generally be protected from the melodrama problem. But if you tend to like an intense scene like I do, um, you have to be very aware of this issue. Uh, it's really important because it's your, it's your area of greatest vulnerability. Um, so what is melodrama? I would say um, melodrama is un earned emotion. It's uh, been said by someone, and I'm sure you'll, somebody will recognize the quote. Uh, hey, Ruthie, it is, um, melodrama is the, I'm trying to remember who said it was, the, is the working off on yourself of emotions you don't really have. So it is, um, a character, normally you would see it as a character going from 
nothing to sudden explosion. And people go like, where the hell did that come from? That is unearned emotion. A character who, um, you know, is always weeping and, you know, it's over the top emotion that we don't, we don't normally feel, we're not feeling it. We're not feeling the rise to that emotion. Um, it's either all at the same pitch. So what you, in fiction, you want to modulate the pitch. It's just like, you know, a symphony or, um, a uh, other piece of music you want modulation rises and falls and rises higher and you work towards a crescendo you know you just don't have a whole piece that's all crescendo it has no shape it has no um it doesn't feel built so you when you're gonna have a big scene you have to build to it you know um I, melodrama is like all highs and lows and nothing, there's no matrix out of which these emotions come, you know, too many similar crescendos, too many similar fights. It, it, you know, if it's a family in conflict, say, um, what keeps a piece like Long Day's Journey into Night, say? Talk about intense and many intense encounters. But I would never say that that was melodramatic. First of all, it is a deeply, it's a deeply felt tragic situation. Everyone in this family has been scarred by every other person in the family. So the scenes are informed by a deeply felt um, kind of constellation of hurts and unmet needs um, and people trying to get what they need uh, from one another. So melodrama is often based on... Um, like, how do you earn emotion? First of all, you, you have to have a, a, um, three dimensional characters you're working with. I mean, classically what we consider a melodrama is something that is staged with, um, actors often moving from town to town or a little opera house in a Western town. Um, it's big, it's cartoony, it's not made out of three-dimensional characters. So you start with your characters and you really understand the shading and gradation of their um, psychology, their physiology, their sociology, what their problem is, what their history is. And then it has to do with the dialogue you know, is it all shouting? Is there any, is there ups and downs? Is, um, is any, is, are there any silences? Are there any points where a character will, will grab the dialogue and not reply and sit in the silence? Melodrama has very little silence. There's very few clocks ticking in melodrama. It's all very loud. So silence is good, quiet. You can have a very intense emotional scene without anybody raising their voice. You know, melodrama is very loud. You know, you must pay the rent. You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. You must pay the rent. You know. It, it, it's uh, it's very broad. It can be seen by, uh, understood by people with a very simple, you, you like that one, okay. <laughs> you must pay the rent. I can't pay, I'll pay the rent. Curses. I hear it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but melodrama is something that is, 
it's very simple. It's almost like a puppet show. It's something you could stage in a puppet theater. Um, oh, oh, how could you be so cruel? Because I'm cruel and I'm the villain. You know, it's like um, when there is a good character shading, a three-dimensional understanding of the characters. It's character-driven. We've talked about how that works. The problem emerges from character, and the characters interact to get what they need. Um, melodrama is... Un <laughs> Thank you, Jill. <laughs> melodrama is unearned emotion. So the writer has not earned it by not examining the characters deeply enough. They're not grounded enough. I mean, at least, say, in fiction, if you're going to have a protagonist who is um, going to be involved in these dramas, that um, you need kind of a slow boil. They can't just come out swinging every time or leaping to whatever emotion. If you notice yourself using certain words like suddenly, you're already uh, behind the curve. You're already grab. You're trying to do something with, with, with. Uh, tr it's kind of. I wouldn't say trickery because it doesn't work very well. But it's it's something you're trying to do with the trickery of language by saying suddenly, you know, Pierre socked her in the face. You know, uh, whenever you see suddenly, stop and think: Have I earned this? Have I built? Am I building to the emotion or am I trying to write to say there is emotion that's not felt? Um, the other thing to know about melodrama is that <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing to know about melodrama is that um, it is uh It's, it's wanting the reader to feel something that you're expressing. It's like you're letting your characters do all the crying, do all the shouting, do all the... Rather than arousing an emotion in the reader. So the reader is... It's like what Andrew said last week about comedy is like if you have your characters laughing, you save your audience the trouble of laughing. <laughs> you don't want to save your character, your audience, the trouble of feeling for your characters. So if your characters are emoting too much, like a bad actor, oh, you know, oh, your reader is then sitting back and watching these characters behave. And that's not what good fiction is about. Hi, Jeff. It's not what good fiction is about. It is about stirring emotion in your reader. So it's not going to be naming emotion. She was trembling with anticipation, you know. I want the reader trembling with anticipation. So if you tend to like high drama in your work, which I certainly do, see if you can take it down a notch on the page to make sure that your reader is doing the responding. The reader is worrying. The reader is, is noticing something suddenly happening. Suddenly there was a, a door slammed. No, you just, the door slammed. That's sudden, isn't it? You know, you're always surprised when the door slams. Um, especially if your character jumps and knocks something over, then you're, you're making that jump that suspense, that that suddenly you're sh you're making something sudden happen, rather than telling us suddenly blah 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 happened. Um, it's uh, so if say there's a scene where 
I'll tell you a scene that I, I had worried about is, um, you know, a death is always a hard one. And if you have people sitting around sobbing, um, you're going to be in danger of tipping into melodrama. You know, think about the all of the liminality of emotion in when there's been a death. There can be a calm. There can be these weird, this weird silliness that can happen. And it's shocking. It's always shocking when you're laughing when somebody has died and you're you're in there with your cousins and somebody says something and everybody starts to laugh and you all feel bad but it's the height of the emotion that is fueling that laughter and you need to make the reader party to that you need to have brought them along to the point where they they understand the 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 moment where emotion is so high that you're they're both you know crying and laughing at the same time because that's what you do in times like that but you can't make the reader feel that just by naming it you have to take them through an emotional process hi Romnick you have to take them through an emotional process so that they're with you when these big things start popping um, otherwise they're watching the characters behave <laughs> oh poor me and it's uh, it is off-putting uh, you, it's cheat it's cheating and your reader feels it it's more it you're beautiful you know it's what's the difference between a Monet painting and Thomas Kincaid what's the difference between beauty and kitsch you know what's what's sentiment we've talked about sentimentality melodrama is very very close to sentimentality in uh, fiction it's unearned emotion so you hit those highs if you like hit them hard but but prepare but prepare the soil of your uh your reader so that it it stream so that they're participating in the scene rather than watching people behave um drama in the greek era uh, in the among the ancient Greeks, you know, drama was their great art form, and the purpose uh, of drama was a communal catharsis that you felt the situation and the movement of that drama so deeply that when you were done with it, you felt cleansed, you wept, you were right there with you know, uh, in the scene where, uh, you know, we, f we realized Medea has, you know, murdered her children. She's so, um, so vindictive, uh, so outraged and humiliated, um, at her husband's betrayal that she kills her own children. And then she's like in kind of a rapture of hatred and then has to, <gasps> you know and then she's killed her children um and we have to be so why is that not melodrama because we under we've lived with her we understand this person you know there's certain people you don't mess with you know they they will go to the end uh to the end of the rainbow um if pushed um and so we we have such a catharsis after these experiences they're so intense but we are part of that we are not watching it happen so uh, it's ruthie says it's about using all the senses it's about using the senses it's about doing the deep character work so we understand the complexity of these people that they are real to us and we see their brightness and shadow we see the 
the dimensionality of the figures. You know, if you only have stick figures or we only get to see them in two dimensions, we're not going to move, the emotion is not going to move. Uh, we're going to be observing um, action rather than participating in the action uh, emotionally. So the senses are important. Uh, the use of language to make sure that you're not you're, you're engaging the reader internally with the characters rather than, um, than watching them behave. Uh, Jeff says, um, our emotions are unpredictable and strangely contrarian to what we're dealing with, especially in situations we're unprepared for. I find stories that convey characters that way gather more response from us as readers. Yeah, I was reading this book about uh, Chekhov um, called Freedom from Violence and Lies. Um, it's a life and works of, of Anton Chekhov. And Chekhov was very interesting because he disagreed with a lot of the way his plays were staged by Stanislavski, the famous um, uh, theater director. And um, he disagreed with the interpretation because Stanislavski slowed everything down, played it as tragic, and it just like the pacing for Chekhov was off. But one of the things that Chekhov said is that the things that the people talk about in his plays, it's not what's really going on. It's often the opposite. What they're saying has has a kind of a, an inverse relationship to what's really going on, uh, the action and the and the discussion will be almost reversed. So it's very interesting. That's why dialogue is interesting, because if you're, that's another thing that will always be melodrama, is oh my God, how could you have done such a thing to me? She said, you know, smacking her head with blah, blah, blah. You know, it's dialogue. If somebody's heart is breaking, first of all, that's, you, you're not going to say her heart was breaking. There's, oh, uh, if I was writing on your page, I would say OTT over the top. You don't want that melodramatic language. You know, um, no cliches. This is the place where you have to dump the cliche, dump the cliche. No stomachs clenching, no hearts breaking. You know, anything that you've seen before on the page is banned. You know, just don't do it. Um, uh, so banning the cliche is really important. Not naming the emotion is really important. You know, don't psychoanalyze your characters. Don't tell us, you know, her heart was breaking, you know, that kind of crap. Put her in a situation where her, anybody's heart would be broken and then have her make a cup of coffee. Because you don't, you don't want the character to cry. You want the reader to cry, you know? So remember who you're, who, who your audience is, you know, whose emotion you're working with. Um, and, you know, to have that separation, you know, into levels of what's going on, to have more than one thing going on. Uh, my uh, old teacher, Kate Braverman, used to say, if you, if you can have your character think about dinner or think about making dinner, thinking about dinner, it's like, they don't have to be thinking about dinner, making dinner. They can make dinner. So you're living in the outer world. You're, you're doing something physical. You're making dinner. You're washing dishes. And you're thinking about something completely different. You know, to layer your scenes like that. Um, so that, say, you know, your uncle just, stole all your aunt's money and, and, uh, that you were hoping, uh, would eventually come to you. And he, you know, um, he's off in Belize, uh, in a dive trip or whatever. And, and the, you're thinking about your aunt, these terrible things that have happened to your aunt 
just happen to your aunt and they really affect the character because there was they have some skin in the game there's some reason that this is extremely upsetting maybe this is what happened in their family maybe that that money was supposed to be theirs there's all kinds of reasons you know they lived through the aunt's last suicide attempt i mean there's some reason that there's a big connection between what's happening to the aunt and then they still have to feed the baby so they're feeding the baby and they're thinking of the aunt and they're thinking about something that happened in their past or whatever so it makes the scene dimensional and real and then it's like who are we crying for what where what exactly is the emotion that we're trying to create here so melodrama is huge it's always huge and indistinct emotions you know it's like terror you know <gasps> you know heartbreak <gasps> you know where's my handkerchief oh <gasps> you know um and what you want is a very is a nuanced emotion it's this pain it's this humiliation it's this problem um, if you look at the anguish in Long Day's Journey into Night, which is the, the I always uh, am referring to the movie because I'm not good at reading plays, um, and you see the every character has such guilt, such guilt, such anguish, such yearning for uh, connection, and the guilt and the failure and the rage that these situations kind of pop the top on them. Um, and there'll be a modulation of the scene through the different, as they move through those different emotions. Um, it's good to know what emotions in the body uh, do. So I've talked about using the Rosetta Stone to uh, look at embodied emotion. So you don't have to just stomach, my stomach hurt, you know, oh, my stomach hurt, you know, clenched your jaw, uh, you know, seen it, seen it, seen it. We, you need to be more specific in something interesting, like doing the Rosetta Stone I mentioned, that which is taking an emotion and then noticing how it appears in the body and it, as you watch it it will move it'll move through the body it doesn't st stay in one place so you know what does disappointment feel like well the next time you're disappointed get that Rosetta Stone out and watch the emotion move through the body and you'll see it'll move it'll cause different parts of the body to feel differently and then if you watch it actually move through you it'll act actually leave the body it's a somatic um uh it's a what do they call it somatic psychology or something where you you deal with emotions in the body um but try not to use the same things you've heard before notice and see if you can use them i i noticed uh with uh shock you know the arms are weak so that if I have a character who just in painted black, my character uh, answers the phone and is told that she needs to, um, she needs to, hi, Carolyn. Carolyn's got a new book coming out, Shadows of Pecan Hollow. Congratulations. Um, the, um, you'll notice that there are things you can use, like for the weak arms. One of the things in Disappointment was weak arms. And so when my character in Painted Black gets a phone call from the morgue and her boyfriend's been missing, and this is like not a good call, she's hearing, everything she's hearing is making her more upset. And then she can barely hold the phone. So I can use that. So use the Rosetta Stone, but just don't, don't do the stomach churning, what Kate used to call a uh, weird climates inside the body. <laughs> you know, uh, use them in an interesting way, things that you haven't seen. So how about emotion like pity? 
uh, MJ asked. An emotion like pity. Sheila pitied him, a terrible pity. That's a start. You know, it's uh, it depends on where you want to go with that. Um, I don't find that melodramatic. Um, you know, Bobby confessed that, uh, that he'd thrown a rock at another kid and then ran away and they're, you know, they were going to have to get an ambulance. Uh, and he, you know, bowed his, you know, he put his head on her knee and, um, Sheila pitied him, a terrible pity. And then tell us something about life, you know, tell, move to a bigger thought. Um, I'm pushing y'all to move to a bigger thought. So Sheila pitied him, a terrible pity. And then maybe tell us something about life. Tell us something about harm. Tell us something about, about the burden of living and, inner, you know, and necessarily um, harming other people just by being alive and what that means. You know, you don't have to just end there. Um, so this is, you know, the different sentimentality is, is not exploring the, the condition, the human condition that is arising. I'm really enjoying, uh, I'm reading the, the Book of Laughter and Forgetting by Milan Kundera. And um, Kundera is, he's, books are always a good, a balance, good books are always a, a, a balance between the intellectual and the emotional. Um, and a book of ideas can be, in my, in my opinion, maybe uh, lacking in the emotion. Um, but a, an emotional book requires the uh, intellectual component to really stick with you to really mean something to pull meaning out of what's happening and not just you know about uncle you know sarah and aunt tom you know uncle tom and aunt sarah um but tell us what it means that's another way that you're not dealing with melodrama you're dealing with the deep roots of the human condition you're making it larger you're making it universal you're telling the reader something. Um, uh, what else do we say? That emotion. Yeah, watch out naming emotion. If you're using N-E-S-S -S words, think again. Think again. Um, Instead of telling us, I felt such tenderness towards Bobby, you know, who just brained the kid with a rock. Um, you can say, you know, I looked at him like a, he's a good metaphor. Um, you know, how we're, you know, I, this, the whole uh, idea of being part of the machine of life uh, and having brained this kid. Um, comes up when I think of that. Um, so if it's more about unearned emotion than unusual events or circumstances a character finds himself in, yes. It's about unearned emotion. So they find themselves in an unusual circumstance. So say um, I'm at odds with another character, uh, Sheila. Sheila, who stole the guy of my dreams when I was in college. And there I am in an office building going for a job interview and the I get caught in the elevator with Sheila. You know, sir, um, coincidence is a dangerous thing. You can get a coincidence early on in a book or a short story. You can start with a coincidence. Um, but generally you want to avoid them, uh, unless it, maybe one, once in a book you get a coincidence, but a lot of times it's sort of a deus ex machina. We don't really believe it. So say, you know, I've seen Sheila around 
but I always avoid her. And then I get in to the elevator because I'm interviewing at Condé Nast or whatever, and she's in the freaking elevator. Okay, so that's then there. I'm believing that. I'm believing it. Uh, it's not completely random. So unusual events or circumstances are interesting, but they shouldn't be completely random. They should have some congruence to who the character is. Then the elevator breaks down and I'm stuck with there with her, you know, and I could end up strang you know, getting her, getting her up against the elevator wall and strangling the shit out of her. Yeah, I, I, I could see that, but you have to build to that. You have to build the tension to that point. Uh, I think that you just have to earn it. Did I earn it? Did I earn it? Did I earn it? I have a violent outburst in the book that I'm writing now. And I just have to go back and go back and go back and make sure that this is motivated, even if it's a sudden outburst, it, that the pressure will have built correctly, that there's enough pressure on that character that they will pop and will pop when they do and make sure that the timing is right, that there's enough uh, preparation so that it makes sense. Uh, um, Grant says, your comments are making me reflect on Solzhenitsyn's gulag where they had to move rocks and boulders back and forth with no meaning. So the suffering, the hopelessness, yeah. But you never want to say suffering, and you never want to say hopelessness. One of those Ness words. You want to show us those things. And maybe in a way that even the character wouldn't be able to say what it is. But we see what it is. Um, if it was us, we would be hopeless. And the character would just say, you know, they carried, you know, Ivan out. Um, he was better out of it now. And there's hopelessness, but you don't say it. Um, Go Janet, get Sheila, <laughs> Jeff says. Yeah. <laughs> I like a big dramatic scene, um, but you have to earn it. I... I there was a time where a lot of people were avoiding the big dramatic scenes in their short stories. If you read a lot of contemporary short stories, you can see there are times that people duck a big dramatic scene because they're afraid to write it because they think they they wouldn't be cool. They're afraid of it being melodramatic. Um, but if you go ahead and do it, just making sure that you have prepared for it, that you have, and you're building towards it, that, that you're not, it's not coming in through left field and you're not just telling us that, you know, she couldn't stand it anymore, you know, show us. So MJ saying, Camus, the stranger, I had only to wish that there be a large crowd of spectators on the day of my execution. They greet me with cries of hate. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's a lot of a matter of taste. And I don't mean it's a matter, uh, you know, it's a matter of opinion. It's you develop a sense of what is over the top. If you're, especially if you're an emotional, expressive writer, you have to develop a sense that uh, that in the old Braverman workshop we used to call the cringe factor, uh, where you write something and it just makes you cringe. That you have to cringe. You have to say, oh, this is so hokey. This is hokey. This is awful. And you have to recognize it in your own work. And often you first recognize it in other people's work. You know, the cringe factor, the hoke factor, sentimentality, the coochie coochie coo thing. <laughs> I remember when my first, um, oh, what was that? Uh, I can't tell that story, sorry. 
but when people are writing a, you know, if I had somebody actually, there was, I can tell, tell this story, uh, Paint It Black, uh, the movie, which just has been out, I think two years now, three years. It's anyway, anniversary of the movie coming out. Um, somebody had optioned it and then never actually got the movie made. Phew. Um, and they had taken this punk rock girl um, and made her say, like, Valley Girl, kind of, oh, my God. So, no. So some of it is, is having a very strong sense of the f voice of your characters, the voice of the book, um, the dimensionality of characterization. And their thought, you know, do they think about, do they make dinner and think about dinner? Or do they make a dinner and remember um, something that, you know, Uncle John said, you know, back in junior high, and then we're Uncle John's at the table saying something else. It's like, you know, I always hated you. <laughs> so dimensionality. All right. Well, let's see what else. See if we have any other questions. Well, that looks good. I uh, so yeah. Watch out for naming emotions rather than making making the emotions manifest in the scene and in the reader. Um, watch out for staying in one note. You know, if you're pitching it high, if there's going to be a big interaction, uh, fight scene or whatever, that there should be rise and fall. You get to the crest and it doesn't, you can't just stay there and stay there throughout the scene. There's going to be rise and fall and a turn, you know. Um, but if people are just shouting, you know, you're not there yet. All right. Well, thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday. Uh, oh, here's books on emotion, Grant asks. Do you utilize them for background framework? Books about emotions. No, I tend to make my own books, like the Rosetta Stone. Um, I I tend to make my own books that I can then refer to, writer's notebooks. You know, how do I feel when somebody humiliates me? How do I feel when somebody surprises me with something I thought they would do, and then they ref it turns out that they're not going to do it. They refuse to do it. They don't want to do it. I remember the dis the. I remember here's a scene. I remember the um, a friend. I had a boyfriend, and we were broke. We were students, and this one friend was talking about going to Hawaii for spring break or something. And I remember just talking about Hawaii, and yeah, that'd be so fun, you know. Like we're having this fantasy of you know what it would be like if we had the money. Um, and then it got closer and he said, you know, so uh, let's pick some dates. My boyfriend and I are going like, what are you talking about? We're not going to Hawaii. That's ridiculous. And he, he was so angry because <laughs> he was a little bit more affluent and he really thought we were going to get tickets and go to Hawaii. <laughs> I remember how angry he was. Now, see, I, if I was writing then, if I was a writer then, which I was writing, but I, I didn't know enough to, to, you know, really observe that interaction. But I, I would keep that in writer's notebook forever uh, of the way that disappointment, outrage when one person's reality uh, is, it just isn't, you know, it isn't the same conversation. We're not having the same conversation. You know, and that's the kind of thing the reader can see that the characters don't see. The reader could see that 
we're fantasizing, but this guy is like serious. So you know something's going to happen. You've prepared. Um, so Malika says, uh, when you send out your stories, do you put a copyright on it? No. Nobody is going to steal your story. You know, you're going to get hit by lightning before anybody steals your story. Um, no, I don't copyright my work. Uh, no, I don't. Um, you know, by the time somebody publishes their own book about Manet, you know, mine will be out. I'm already ahead of them. So, uh, no, I don't. People worry about that, you know. I think if you have a high, if you have a high, uh, what do they call a high concept, uh, story idea, uh, and you're in a writer's group, you know, you can certainly say, uh, you know, this is my idea and, uh, you know, this is not open for other people to use. Okay. No, let them know because writers steal everything. You know, I do. <laughs> Most people do. They, they're like magpies. Anything that's shiny that we're not specifically told, no, this, you know, please don't use this character name or please don't use this. Um, but no, copy, nobody does that. That's like really amateur. Um, you know, you have files. If it comes out in the New Yorker and you have files and they're, and they're dated, you know, that you have a right to sue. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good day and I wish you good writing and we'll be here next week. So please send me your questions. I'm always happy to, um, always happy to uh, answer them or, or try. <laughs> okay. Bye.